Merry Christmas and welcome to Compass Online. My name is Jen and I serve as the director of Group Life. We are so glad you joined us today as we celebrate Christmas and reflect on the miracle of the incarnation and the truth that Jesus is with us today. He is here. We have a great service planned with singing, scripture, teaching, and communion. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and gather some juice and crackers or bread so you can participate at home when we come to communion a little later in the service. A new year means new opportunities, and we've got an exciting one for you. You won't want to miss this. Starting January 23rd, in conjunction with our new teaching series called Cancel Chaos, we are launching a six-week Compass Book Club. Together as a church, we will read the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. Our consumer-driven, rat race culture often leaves us stressed and exhausted. It's time to lead a slower, simpler, and more fulfilled life. Join us in discovering the life-giving rhythms of God in our hurried world. Our hope is to have book clubs right across our region that you can invite your friends, neighbors, and coworkers to. But before we do that, we need hosts. If you have a heart for people, are willing to offer your time, share what you're learning, and turn on a video, then you can host a book club. It's that simple, and we've even made it simple to sign up. All you have to do is scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description and it will take you to our book club webpage where you can get more information and sign up to be a host. We would love for you to consider this. Today is the third Sunday of Advent and our focus is on the peace that Jesus brings. As we begin the service, Pastor Andrew will lead us in the lighting of our Advent wreath and the candle of peace. Today our focus is on the candle of peace. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The word translated peace is from the Hebrew word shalom, and it means harmony, wholeness, completeness, and blessing. The invitation is that the closer we draw to God and to His kingdom, the more of His peace and shalom we can experience. Have you noticed in the last 15 to 20 months the accelerating polarization, frustration, and anger that so many are experiencing? There is such a need for listening, kindness, compassion, and peace. Jesus didn't come just to end conflicts and squabbles between family and friends. He came to take away the sin, which is the cause of the hostility that we feel within ourselves, in relationship to others, and even towards God. The result of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is that our sin has been forgiven. And now we can learn to live in peace with God, ourselves, and others. Jesus, in fact, becomes our peace who has broken down the walls of hostility. And that shalom is something that we can experience every day in real life situations. In John 14, 27, in the midst of real uncertainty and worry, Jesus gives the promise, peace I give to you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. In addition to the candles of hope and love, we now light the candle of peace and we pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us your Son, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Thank you for caring for us so much and for promising to lead us into shalom. Guard our hearts and our minds with your peace. You know the things that have been weighing us down, the worry, anxiety, and fear. Lord, we surrender these things to you and we ask that you would help us fix our minds on you instead. Lead us into the way of peace and that brings new life this Christmas, we pray. Amen.
In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt continue through Advent, uh, we want to read a portion of the Christmas story each week. Um, And today we are reading from Luke chapter 1. Mary was greatly troubled at the angel's words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. 
the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her six months, for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left. i 
Lord Jesus, you were born to set us free from our sins and our fears. You are our hope, our strength. We pray that you would today renew our desire and feed the flame of our joy. We are here to worship you and we are here to learn from you. So teach us, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> well, maybe, but not necessarily. You know, Christmas is like, it's like an amplifier. It makes things louder, including our emotions. You know, when life is good, when everything is merry and bright, that sense of happiness and glad tidings gets even louder at Christmas, right? Right? The decorations look shinier. The eggnog tastes noggier. The songs sound hollier and jollier. The festive parties seem more festive. Hey, the Hallmark movies. Well, we can even overlook the fact that everyone has the exact same plot. <laughs> Successful business owner from the city comes back to their small hometown for the holidays falls in love with the handsome plaid wearing recluse who owns a Christmas tree farm on the edge of town. <laughs> and despite the impossible obstacles to their relationship, it all gets rectified just in time on Christmas Eve. Well, at least that's how I heard they go, right? <laughs> we, can over, we can even overlook that. The good feelings get amplified at Christmas. But so, so do the negative ones. Christmas can be an incredibly difficult time for many people, a time when sadness and, and stress and, and loneliness get even louder. You know, the Centers for Disease Control list the holidays as the time of year when the highest percentage of adults uh, experience anxiety and, and depression. In their latest study, 44.7% of the adults they surveyed reported some level of increased anxiety or depression over the holiday season. That's almost half the people watching today. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The colder weather, the financial stress that's often associated with Christmas, relational conflict usually gets amplified at Christmas. What do you mean I have to, I have to cook the turkey again this year? Feelings of grief, regarding loved ones that we've, we've lost this past year, like who's not around the Christmas tree this year. Christmas falls at the end of the calendar year, and for many people, that causes them to reflect on, on another year and wonder if they've, they've really made a difference. And oh yeah, we're still in a pandemic. Everything gets amplified at Christmas including the hard things and the confusing things. And if that's you this Christmas, I just want to legitimize and acknowledge your experience. It can be hard. You know, sometimes Christmas is a reminder that troubling things happen in our world and behind the twinkling lights and the colorful gifts and the joyful songs can lurk confusion and sadness and questions. And yet he is here, right? That's our Christmas series title. 
but it's more than just an idyllic title. It's a reality. You know, we talked about the incarnation to kick off our series, how Jesus is God with us. He is the word. God has spoken through Jesus. You know, I came across a great quote this week by David Paulison. He says, God has spoken deeper than what hurts, brighter than what is dark, more enduring than what is lost, and truer than what has happened. And this is all true in Jesus. And so my question for us today is, is like, how do we navigate this? You know, when Christmas is such an amplifier, when darkness gets amplified, when conflict gets amplified, when confusion gets amplified, when grief gets amplified, when anxiety screams so loudly in our souls that we can barely hear the voice of hope, whisper. He is here. How do we navigate life? Well, today God's word can help us do that by considering a Christmas story that is rife with confusion and conflict and question, the story of Joseph. You know, in our series, we've talked about the incarnation. Last week, we talked about anticipation. Well, today our word is consideration because Joseph had a lot to consider in his heart that first Christmas. And maybe you're feeling the same way this Christmas. Please turn with me in your Bible or on your device to Matthew chapter one, verses 18 through 25. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. What do we know about Joseph? The answer outside of being the earthly father of God is... Not very much, actually. His life really is a whisper. You know, outside the Christmas narrative, there's only a mention of Joseph regarding the episode of Jesus staying behind to teach in the temple when he was 12 years old. And the Bible writers don't even mention his name in that account. In fact, when Mary tells the young Jesus that she and her father were worried sick, he reminds them about who his real father was. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I'd be in my father's house, the temple? We know Joseph was a carpenter. We don't know if he was a good one. <laughs> we know he was a descendant of King David's royal family line, but really not much more. Joseph isn't mentioned in relation to Jesus's earthly ministry, there are no recorded conversations between Joseph and Jesus, no fatherly heart-to-hearts in the workshop. Hey, listen, son, when you're crafting a table, make sure you hold the chisel at this angle. None of that. There's even speculation that Joseph may have died before Jesus was identified and revealed as the word before his ministry, before his crucifixion. Because when they dedicated Jesus to the Lord as a baby in Luke chapter 2, Simeon prophesies to Mary directly, Mary, and a sword will pierce your soul too. But nothing to Joseph. You know, you might have thought the earthly father of the Messiah might get a, a little more play, but that's not the case. Joseph's story is brief. You know, generally, the Bible doesn't tend to focus on people's backstory unless it's important information. Instead, the Bible, it, it tends to focus on the parts of people's lives that, that really are, are important in communicating God's message to us. And so, although we don't know a lot about his story, we can be sure that the part that we do know, the part that we're going to read is important because God has included it in his word. So let's dive in, let's read his story. His life really is a whisper, but these seven verses, well, they scream about the difference that it makes that he is here. When life gets confusing, when life gets painful, when we have more questions than answers. In Joseph's brief story, we learn a lot about our story. Let's go. 
This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, our guy. (laughs) But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. The first thing that we learn from Joseph's story is even though Jesus is here, our stories sometimes have confusing chapters. Author and pastor Tim Keller wrote this. He said, we want the storyline of our lives to go from strength to strength, from success to success and end happily ever after. But throughout the Bible, we see something completely different a persistent narrative pattern of life through death, of triumph through weakness. And it's true, you know, the the most incredible stories in the Bible contain some of the biggest questions around them. Abraham, before he becomes the father of a nation, he climbs up a mountain and God asks him to sacrifice his own son? Really? Moses, before he becomes the deliverer who would lead Israel through the wilderness to the promised land, is actually forced into the wilderness for for killing an Egyptian. Before Joseph, the other Joseph, the Old Testament Joseph, becomes second in command of all of Egypt, he's falsely accused of assault and tossed in jail. Like, what's up with that? Esther, before she becomes the courageous queen who had to rescue a people group from mass genocide, is forced to be a member of the king's harem, hiding her true identity, living as an exile? Here's a question. Before Jesus is lifted up as king of kings, he is lifted up as a criminal on a wooden cross of shame? Like, what's going on? So many questions. And Joseph's story is a story full of confusion, full of questioning. He's newly engaged to the woman he loves, the rest of their lives ahead of them, big dreams. Right, like all married couple, big dreams in his heart, big ambitions. Mary, we can do anything. We can be anything. When suddenly, boom, Question, insert large question mark. Suddenly his story takes a direction that he did not see coming. See, do not miss how confusing this would be to Joseph and how scandalous to everyone else. Okay, Joseph is engaged to be married, of course, to a young virgin named Mary. And at this time in Jewish culture, engagement looked like a lot different than it does for us today. Like now, if you're engaged to be married to somebody somebody and something goes like sideways, well, then you just, you break off the engagement, right? Hey, like a good thing we ended this before we got married and things got really complicated. Like maybe a little bit awkward, but hardly unheard of. Happens all the time. But... Back in Joseph's time, engagement was a binding legal agreement. This is huge. This is huge. Engagement was actually a part of the marriage covenant. A young couple would be engaged for a year's time. And if during that year, that time you want to break the engagement, like you actually had to file for a legal divorce or or die. (laughs) Like that that, that was your two choices. So serious was engagement that if one of the people actually involved did die, well, the one left behind would actually be called a widow or a widower. They're engaged. Their lives are basically carved in stone. And so let's try to get inside the the head and the heart of Joseph for this really strange and awkward conversation that Mary would have initiated. Uh, Joseph, honey, we need to talk. It seems I'm pregnant. (laughs) But don't, 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 don't jump to conclusions. Listen, I've got really good news. 
I wasn't unfaithful to you. The Holy Spirit did this to me. So it's all good. Like, what do you do with that? The girl that he had planned to spend his life with, the girl he loved, is either completely del- delusional <laughs> or she's a liar. Either way, his world just got rocked. And immediately, Joseph is forced to start asking some serious questions about the path forward, and none of these paths are the one that he wanted. Option number one, (laughs) stay with Mary. But if I stay with her, it's not going to be good for either one of us. Being pregnant out of wedlock in this culture wasn't just frowned upon, it was a crime. (laughs) Like they might stone her for this. And Joseph would also be marked for the rest of his life. Either he got her pregnant out of wedlock, or some other dude did. Either way, whatever people thought, life would get extremely difficult for Joseph in that culture and more so for Mary. Option one, stinks. Option two, not much better, divorce her. Although also not a great path forward, it it might be the most noble thing to do because like if I do it quietly and... I don't stand up in the town square and scream, she cheated on me, stoner. (laughs) Maybe she could go somewhere else before it became obvious that she was pregnant and she could get a new start. It's still going to be tremendously difficult for her. But I think divorce is like the lesser of two evils. Either way, option one or option two, Joseph's whole world just fell apart. And he's left with more questions than answers. Why is this happening? And you know, for us, even though he is here, often in life we come face to face with Joseph moments, don't we? Why is this happening? Those times when we just don't understand what is going on. Those moments when we're forced to make really hard decisions when we're we're forced to to choose a path forward and none of the options look great. Those moments when we have more questions than answers, maybe you're facing a situation like that this Christmas. Maybe. You can relate with Joseph. Why is this happening? This is not what I asked for. I haven't done anything wrong, and yet here I am. Forced between a rock and a hard place with seemingly no good way forward. No good answers. Man, I got a lot of questions. A lot of questions. We all face those times in life. But I want to encourage you this Christmas that he is here. And because he is here, even when we don't understand what's happening in our stories, we can trust that God is still writing our stories. Even when we don't understand what is happening in our stories, we can trust that God is still writing our stories. Let's keep reading. Joseph has decided that divorcing Mary is the lesser of two evils. Pick up the story in verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. (laughs) Whoa. A lot to digest there. But here's here's what I love about this. Here's what I love. See, Joseph had already made up his mind, right? To divorce Mary. He'd already established in his heart what he was going to do. Divorce. And it would have been a mistake and it would have led to disastrous results. But before he divorced Mary, God stepped in. 
Joseph thought that, that he was being forced to, to write his own story, his own book. But God took the pen out of his hand and took over his story. And it wasn't too late. God is never late. God is never late. And you know, when we don't know what the right thing to do is, when we're confused, when we're hurting, when we're feeling overwhelmed, when life feels like it's spiraling out of control, when our stories look like they're, they're heading to uncertain endings, God is still writing our stories. When it looks like we're alone in our story, we're not. He is here. And it's not too late. God's never late. And you know, just, just like Joseph divorcing Mary, there isn't a mistake that we can make that is too big for God to redeem. There isn't a sin so egregious that God can't forgive it. There isn't a darkness so oppressive that God can't shatter it with his light. There isn't a story so dysfunctional. And trust me, it doesn't get much more dysfunctional than Joseph's story that God can't write a beautiful ending to. And there isn't a difficult story this Christmas that you are walking through, that you are facing, that God doesn't care about, that he won't help you through, and that he won't help you write. He reminded, that, he reminded Joseph that he is here in a dream. As Joseph slept, as he rested, as the frenetic pace of his life diminished, as his anxiety was replaced by quietness, God spoke. Where can you rest this Christmas? Create margin, slow down, quiet your soul. In your season of confusion, <laughs> so that God can remind you that he is here, that he's in control, that he has a plan, that he loves you deeply, that he is writing your story. You know what, I love the, the first words that the angel of the Lord speaks to Joseph in his dream. In light of all of his anxiety and, and then the conflict that must've just been overwhelming his, his heart, the angel says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. First thing the angel says to him, not, hey, don't, divor don't divorce her bonehead, <laughs> or, hey, Joseph, here's the plan. No. Don't be afraid. God has got this. God has got you, my friend. Hey, maybe, maybe right now in this moment, we could slow down and be quiet and rest. And we could allow God to speak over whatever is overwhelming our hearts. That we could be reminded in our season of questioning that he is here. Could we, could we actually do that? You know, I think we could all use the reminder in the busyness of, of the Christmas season of verses 22 and 23 from Joseph's dream, spoken over our lives, over our situations today. Hey, what, whatever difficult or confusing circumstance that you are facing this Christmas, I want you to identify that thing in your heart right now. And for a moment, let's just quiet our souls. Let's bring our questions under the promises of God's word from Joseph's dream. Do not be afraid. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means 
God with us. He is here. Let that speak over our questioning hearts. He is here. Thank you, God. And finally, because he is here, we can walk confidently into our story knowing who the author is. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Hey, still lots of questions and confusion rattling around in Joseph's heart, I'm sure, even, even after his dream. I'm sure he wasn't like, oh, <laughs> The Holy Spirit really did impregnate my, my fiance. And, and what's this? We're going to have a prophesied about boy, and I'm to name him Jesus. They'll call him Emmanuel, God with us, so divinity. Hmm. And he will, he will save mankind from their sins. Well, that changes everything. Thanks for the, the clarity, my angelic friend. Just a big misunderstanding, really, wasn't it? My bad. Nah, like Joseph likely had more questions after his dream, but here's the difference. Here's the difference. Here's why he could wake up, obey God, and walk into the future that God had for him. He didn't have all the answers. But he didn't need them because he had something better. He is here. After his dream, Joseph knew that, that God is in this. That he was not alone. And just like, like God was bigger than, than the mistake of his plan to divorce Mary, just like God was bigger than any obstacles that would lie ahead for Joseph, and there would be more obstacles. Okay, his story does, doesn't get clearer. It just gets more fuzzy. A long trip to Bethlehem with a very pregnant bride. No rooms available for the delivery. Forced to flee as refugees to safety in a foreign land because of an unstable and evil king? Still lots of questions. But Joseph knew that God was in it, and so he could move ahead in obedience and faith. So can you. So can you. He is bigger than any obstacle ahead in your life. So what is God calling you to do? Do it. You might not have all the answers. You might still have many questions. But you do not have to let your confusion and fear paralyze you. Because he's here. You can keep moving forward. You can keep obeying God. You can keep serving. You can keep praying. You can keep seeking. You can keep knocking. You can keep taking one step of faith followed by another step of faith, knowing with all the confidence of heaven that your God's name is Emmanuel. And that means he's with you. And that means you can trust him in whatever story is being written in your life this Christmas. To turn difficult and confusing chapters into beautiful and victorious endings. And so over the story of your life this Christmas, I write this title. 
He is here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the story of Joseph this Christmas from your word. Thank you that in it, we find a promise. A promise that says, although life is full of confusing moments and questions, your love brings clarity to our minds. Your hope is the answer for our souls and your presence is peace for our troubled hearts. Help us bring our questioning hearts before you this Christmas in faith, trusting in the promise of Emmanuel, our ever-present Savior. And it's in his beautiful name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Hi, everyone. My name is Deb. This morning, we are going to share communion together. Communion is our opportunity to remember all Jesus has done for us through his death and resurrection and pause to be thankful for the sacrifice Jesus has made for us. This month at Compass, we are in the middle of our Christmas series, He Is Here. This morning, as we share communion, we see the story of the Last Supper as a beautiful reminder of Jesus' promise to us that He would be here in our midst by the power of the Holy Spirit. The bread and the juice help us to remember what Jesus did for us over 2,000 years ago. The Last Supper begins with Jesus in Jerusalem for the Passover meal, with his disciples. Jesus had sent Peter and John ahead to acquire the room and prepare the Passover meal. In the evening, Jesus gathered with his disciples, who were his traveling companions, his followers, and his closest friends. They shared a meal that consisted of ordinary, everyday items, two of which were the bread and the wine. It was a meal like many they had shared before. But this meal would be different. Jesus knew this would be his last meal with his friends. The disciples would have seen the food on the table before them that symbolized the exodus of their ancestors leaving Egypt. They would have been reminded by the unleavened bread of the haste of their ancestors leaving, and the wine, which is a reminder of the blood sacrifice of an animal that the Hebrews put on their doorposts so the angel of death would pass by the family within the home. The Israelites had been remembering the miraculous exodus of their ancestors and freedom from slavery for 1,400 years. In Psalm 77, it says, We remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. This verse was referring to the exodus of God's people. For the disciples, the bread and the wine were familiar symbols of God's amazing miracle to save his people from Egyptian slavery. They grew up hearing the story. They would have known it word for word. But this night was different. Jesus did what he does best. He takes the familiar, the redemptive symbols of God's action at Passover and infuses them with new significance. The bread and the wine before them were now to remind them of a one-time sacrifice that Jesus would make on the cross for the whole world. Jesus knew the importance of remembering, and this meal was to remember not only the sacrifice on the cross, but also to remember his great love for us. During the meal, he would tell the disciples, no greater love has a person than to lay down their life for another. He would wash their feet as a display of the heart of a servant king. We remember so we can proclaim his death and resurrection until he returns. Jesus did what only he can do. He took the simple and made it divine for anyone to receive. The one who was the bread of life held up the bread, and as he tore it, he said, This is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, This is my blood poured out for you. No longer only symbols of freedom from Egyptian slavery for the Jewish people at Passover, the bread and the wine would now be remembered for what Jesus had done for us. His death on the cross and resurrection and freedom from the captivity of sin and death for the whole world. John would much later pen these words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Paul wrote in the book of Titus, We are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That verse reminds us that we are absolutely waiting in anticipation for His return. Well, this morning, Jesus, we remember you, your suffering, and your great love for us. As Christ followers, we are now free from the slavery of sin and death. Jesus said, in this world, you will have troubles, but I have overcome the world. 
Whatever you're facing today, as we partake together with these familiar symbols, be reminded that because of Jesus, the familiar becomes the extraordinary. They are a reminder of His great love and sacrifice for us. They are a reminder of the hope that one day He will return. They are a reminder that He is here. If you are watching today and you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus, there is no better time to acknowledge His death and resurrection and accept the freedom He offers in a new life with Him. To realize that you are not perfect, that you have sin in your life, and are in need of a Savior. And let us remember together. And He took the bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it, and He said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the juice together. Let's pray. God, thank you for sending your son to be the perfect sacrifice for the entire world. Thank you for bringing us through his death and resurrection into a kingdom where the poor and the sick and the sad are called blessed and the greatest in the kingdom. Lord, help us to embrace the gift of salvation that you have given us through Jesus. Amen. It's been so good to be together and to be reminded that he is here. As you go, we want to remind you about our Christmas Eve services at 2, 4, and 7 p.m. Be sure to invite friends and family to join us and reserve your spot on our website so we can plan accordingly. You can also enjoy the service at home by watching online beginning December 22nd. Our service on Boxing Day will be online only at 10 a.m. And our elders will lead us in a special time of worship and testimony. Don't forget to take some time this week to consider hosting a book club and then circle back to our website to sign up. If you're ready to say yes to hosting, go ahead and scan that QR code and let us know. We invite you to participate in the Raise the Roof year-end financial challenge. Compass is seeking to raise $85,000 to repair the roof and water damage over the auditorium and to support people in our community who need a little extra help this Christmas. This is a critical need that we are trusting God to provide for. All the details are on our front page of our website under the Give button. And as always, if we can pray with you today about any need in your life or in the life of someone you know, visit our digital prayer card on the website. Now let us go from this place proclaiming that we have seen the glory of God, believing that there is a light that shines in the darkness, which the darkness shall not overcome. And may the love of the Father, the hope of the Spirit, and the peace of the Christ child be with you this Christmas and forevermore. Amen.
Thank you.